Hello, thanks for joining me. So I wanted to take you through my process for creating a character. And here we have the character of this little sheep, kind of creepy necromancer style sheep that I designed. I drew it in the sketchbook and I thought, oh, this is a great um, time to show you some process refinement for kind of character design, as well as what I do for my process for kind of this um, illustrated field guide I'm working on. So the first thing I do is I want to explore other options for the face and head. So I did like my first pass, but I want to go ahead and um, take a look at other options, you know, within that. Like are there variations to the way that we're doing the eyes, the way that we're handling the horns that would make this character more interesting or read better. Um, and you can see I'm working in really basic shapes, uh, kind of like just really trying to get that first read that initial read is really important and blocking out those shapes and you know I'm a, an eraser <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a draw you know find find my line and then draw a thicker line I am an eraser uh, but you can see here I'm also doing kind of like that classic old person mouth that cartoon old person mouth because even though this is like a creepy character the idea is that at its heart it's got to have some charm to it. It's got to look quirky or cute or unique. That's just kind of my philosophy is like, um, I'm not edgy. <laughs> I haven't had a, you know, terribly tough life, but I am kind of weird. And that's how I can do that. I had this idea that maybe she had a scar on her face and then that eye would be grayed out. But ultimately that would ruin the one facing eye that really kind of lends itself to this droopy kind of like almost like dopey look. And I lose that, so I decided not to. And then I just roughly go in and, and get the rest of the eye in there. Get this nice droopy, kind of almost like a um, hound dog jowl beneath the eye going. All right. So I'm continuing to refine that eye, trying to find other shapes and other things that make sense. And ultimately, I decide to go very close to the initial uh, look. But you can see that I'm lowering that, that jowl. I'm making I'm exaggerating it. Um, and I think something of that ends up in the final. Um, ultimately, I think I scan in the original and copy that and enlarge it. But this process still helps because the original had the ear covered by the horn, by kind of a curly Q horn. Uh, but in this one, I was able to design a horn that goes around the ear and up back to the thing. And I think it's a better read from a silhouette perspective. Also, you can see the ear, you can see more of the face and also lead your eye back to the face. So I keep the curly cue on the hidden side of the face, but I throw it on there there. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm adding these contour lines. And these help the read of each of these horns, makes it look textured, but also makes it look rounded, right? It's a very simple shape. It's, it's just a basic, you know, two ellipses um, kind of concentrically on each other and you're just tapering them and then finding a rounded point. So I think I've kind of played with this as much as I want. I make some notes to myself. There's an, a tooth I drew and like, why do I need that? So I also had this idea, okay, well, what if, um, the sheep was like, what if in the illustration I have the sheep and I show the sheep without the kind of gown on? And the idea there is like maybe this sheep used to kind of have like a like a, a darker past, you know, like it's a um, it's like a necromancer sheep where it's like really into like kind of that chains and whips thing. So almost like a like a heavy metal sheep. Um, and ultimately, I don't think that it's funny, but I don't know if that it necessarily works for what I'm doing or the world I'm building. But from an illustrated per it's, it's an interesting task. It's an interesting thing to do because you can see I can, I've got that head shape just down and I'm trying to find like what would make an interesting body and what would fit under that, that bell-shaped gown. And you see I'm making some finding lines here for my haunches and my arms and you know where I think the belly would be. And ultimately, I kind of move everything down and this is why I don't think it, it would work necessarily for what I have in mind because... I've got a lot of empty space here, and I feel like it it makes the character feel right. But when you do this without any clothes on, like you're like, well, where's all that empty space coming from? 
Okay, and then we are going to continue here with getting these leg shapes. And I wanted to make sure we had some nice knobby knees um, following down to the kind of like standard, you know, cleft hoof that you might find in the sheep. And then trying to find, okay, you know, are we going to do udders? And I, I've drawn a pair of kind of like a an udder there. And then I'm just trying to find some basic placement for the arms. And, and I'm not doing too much with the arms. I'm really sticking to very simple shapes here. The whole idea behind this field guide is that these anthropomorphized creatures aren't going to be terribly detailed. Like, I don't intend this to be close to realism or, or close to, you know, these really highly detailed drawings you see from other artists. You know, I can think of the Humblewood or the Guelph books. Like, that's not something, or even Redwall. Like, I'm, I'm, that's not my style. I'm, I'm looking for more of, like, that, that kind of cartoony, like, hey, this could be produced pretty quickly by, by an animation team kind of style right? Um, I'm still throwing on texture there. I still want to make sure that we have a good silhouette read, but um, I do ultimately really want a, um, you know, a, a style that, that makes sense for me, but it also is, is repeatable for me um, and will not, like, take so much time, right? I, I feel like these are taking a ton of time and the less time I can take, the better. And you can see some stink lines and some flies there. But, uh, you know. And then we're, we're throwing on some, like, <laughs> some scratches, some scarring, and some, like, a little pentagram tattoo. But, you know, that I don't think this is something that would actually, you know, make it in. And, and it's really not the look I'm going for for the world again. So, um, but fun, fun idea. And, uh, you know, maybe it's something that we can use. We can use for another character. So a good exercise, a good practice nonetheless. All right, now moving into the second step. So I've taken that, that initial drawing, I've copied it, and enlarged it times two. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and tape it to another tabloid piece of paper. And this is just so that I don't lose my place and it doesn't come undone. And you can see it's on my light table already, so I'm ready to do some some tracing and refine kind of the, the image more. It, I was taught once you find a thumbnail that you like, you keep that thumbnail through because the shape language that's in that thumbnail is something you want to keep. And you don't throw that away and redraw it for the sake of redrawing it, making it neater. You can do that through the process. And so we actually, I end up redraw, redrawing these things a couple of times. Um, this second pass you could call kind of like a, um, oh, I don't know, like a, a rough here. You know, excuse the camera shake. I'm finding, finding some um, additional, uh, additional stuff. You can see my drawers are a complete mess. <laughs> uh, there we go. Back to it. All right. So let's see. Um, how to talk about this process. All right. First thing you're going to notice. I've got out the templates for the rounds. So obviously the first thing you're saying is like, okay, that's cheating. And I totally get that idea, right? But you know, whereas artists have always thought is that we're using reference, we might be using textures, we might be using photo bashing techniques. The idea is the final output is what's important. The steps to get there or not like it's it's about what your art creates with the message so that's why i don't eschew the use of templates or rounds or ellipse to you know ellipse guides or anything like that um really and because because so much of my stuff is in vector like it doesn't make sense not to work that way to begin with right i'm going to clean this up digitally so why wouldn't i want a perfect circle for the eyeball or the iris or the way the horns turn that's part of the world I'm building is that it's going to have these these perfect rounds in it. It's going to have these shapes that are like, okay, there's a lot of like simple simple curves and and you know, like okay, I can see where that's just a perfect circle or that's a an oval. But really the the charm is that plus the texture, right? It's it's like a, it's simple, but also it's got its complexity within the texture of the ink that I do later, and also of like the little um, hash lines and things like that. And ultimately the color and texture I add later. 
All right, and this process continues for quite a while. We're gonna do this redrawing. Um, really, we're refining the shapes that we already put down without a template. We are finding where we want these final shapes to go and really getting like everything nailed down so that um, when we move this to a Bristol, Bristol paper, right, we can um, we don't have to think anymore. We just concentrate on making nice clean lines, right? getting to where we need to go in the next step. And I actually don't show that next step because really it's just this repeated. Um, it's, it's further refining this look. You know, ideally I'd be able to get from the enlarged rough to the Bristol paper in one, in one transfer, but just not there yet. So, um, but you know, what am I finding? I'm finding things like this, this interesting lip shape where I really am adding, I feel character, the character to the, um, to the design. And then, really making sure to refine where we're putting all of these little marks, all of these little hashes. What, how, what is the length of each of these hashes? Where does it extend beyond the boundaries of the character, right? To add to that, you know, this is a, a worn, this is an older character, right? So we want to make it look warm. We want it to have that like, hey, I'm not quite all put together. It's been a while. I'm a little bit, you know, frayed at the edges. And um, so you can see that in, you know, like there's little, little hashes, there's little uh, pieces of tufts of hair poking up all over the place, right? And then just com continue to get through this and make these refinements as we go. I want to take a, a couple minutes here um, just to talk generally about what my idea for this fantasy field guide, if you will, is. Um, I don't know if I've always been, you know, I know I've always been the fantasy stuff, always been to Dungeons and Dragons, um, but uh, I went to Comic-Con a couple of years ago, and I had several people who were there interested in some of the work that I had done that are like, almost like character sheets or pages from like a monstrous manual. And some, some people commented, they said, you know, these would be really great in some kind of collected book. You're building this really interesting world here. I just need more. And I get that because when I go to the Comic Con, that's what I look for. It's a book. You know, there, it's rare that I walk away with just a print or a t shirt. Really, the my sh I've got three big shelves. Uh, if you guys have watched my workspace walkthrough, big shelves just covered in these books. And, you know, it is because that it feels like a good value for, for my spend, but also is that world building to me has always been interesting. Um, if you guys remember those, those books that you got when you were kids, uh, there's a gnomes book that I just remember loving that had a story. There's an under, there's an underneath story, but really it was about the world that these characters live in. Right. And those, those kind of kids books always interested me. The, um, the, where they explain, you know, what's going on, how these processes work. Dinotopia is a perfect example. Dinotopia is a story, right? But ultimately, what are we doing in that? We're, we're exploring the world. We're finding about all these details that, you know, I have a feeling that authors want to put in the forefront, but don't because it, it, it lessens the story. But for me, it feels like such a integral part of like, not only my childhood, but just kind of like what content I like to consume is I want to, I want to know all the ins and outs of the world, you know. I want to know. It's like those Star Wars books that are the cross sections of all the ships. Like, no one really needs that to understand who Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker are, but it's interesting in that it tells us more about the world. So, you can see that we've moved on beyond the horns and the face, and now we're detailing the rest of the costume. So, I want the cloak to be simple. Uh, I don't want that to be the focal point. Really, it's going to be large areas of texture for us to rest our eyes on. We might be able to do some color variation in there or something to draw the eye back into the face, which I, I feel like is going to be either black or white or a combination of the two. But we're going to do like a kind of a, a janky, beaten up old bell. Um, we're going to do this, a collar. To support it and then we're also going to detail out this necklace of 
of teeth is what I'm thinking they are. I mean, maybe they're bone shards or whatever, but but ultimately they end up being teeth in the, in the later in the later versions of this. And that's not even something that I find at this point. So you can see those those where that revision sequence actually kind of helps you think more and more and more about your character, right? And as I keep going, you can see it's not just making the lines, it's also thinking about, well, you know, am I creating tangents with these lines, unintended tangents? Um, how do I want this to really, to really look? And are the things I placed in the right place? You know, are the, are the hooves and the feet where I want them? There's a nice simplified, you know, foot form there, and I could probably just go with those kind of simple sticks with, you know, uh, rounds. But I want something that's got a little more character, and you can, I'm throwing some tufts of fur in there, I'm giving them a bit more consistency, and then I'm, I'm throwing together, you know, these wrappings on them, right? And you can even see right here, they're, they're actually uneven. And so in my next rev, I actually go in and even those up by, you know, removing the tape, moving the, moving it down and, and redrawing those with a little more length and uh, more of a mind towards, hey, let's make them sit on the same plane. It's funny, um, now every time I watch myself brush the paper off with my hand, I'm cringing because all I can think about is all the unintended smudges you create when you do that. <laughs> it's, um, it's something that my kids do and almost like as a nervous tick they do it and it's it's from me uh, but it's just one of those things where I'm like oh why would you ever do that you know people use the blow you know you can blow on them you can use a brush which makes a lot more sense um, I even bought one of those gloves you use for tablets that has like the you know it doesn't conduct electricity but also it's kind of a smudge guard uh, just so I don't continue to drag graphite along the the paper as I do this. I'm not wearing it today because I felt like it was a little hokey for, you know, you guys might be like, what are you wearing this glove for? And it's just another thing to explain, which I ended up explaining anyways, but um, I wanted a pretty, you know, clean, clean process here. Um, and you can see as I'm going through the cloak, I'm, I'm drawing these details out for the cloak. What I'm, what I'm thinking here is that I want a tartan at the top. It uses a patch to cover kind of her humpy, her humpy back. Um, you know, she's she's an older sheep. She's got like these um, this spine that's kind of curved with age and weight, right? And uh, that what my thought was is that I'm going to do that digitally and then lay it in in post in a way that you know is flat and it's kind of got a very specific illustrative look. And then I'm kind of going through here and roughing up the shape for what's the sleeve and you know I think you can see that we're playing pretty hot fast and loose with the with the anatomy here but getting to where we want to go right we've got the basic shape we've got our sleeve we've got a nice like sleeve cap for her arm to spear in we're doing a um, kind of a, a limpy <laughs> you know arm with a hoof on the end and then we've actually even moved our uh, silhouette in a little bit to make, actually to confirm, conform a little bit closer what we did with the, um, the naked sheep that we drew in the, the sketchbook earlier. And then I've decided, you know, what would be interesting, because I want something for the sheep to do. I think, is the sheep some kind of traitor? Is she some kind of wizard? Um, what is she going to do in the world? Is I was like, well, wouldn't it be interesting... You know, sheep's are usually herbivores. What if she was kind of like this butcher or like this roadside meat seller? Which, you know, kind of sounds gruesome. And I, I just said, you know, I'm going to embrace it. She's got that old, like, I don't care look. Like, maybe she's selling other, you know, other, um, what is it? What is a sheep? A sheep is a four, a quadruped. She's selling other quadruped meats or, you know, like other barnyard animals meats. I I don't know. I, or maybe she's more like exotic meats. Like maybe it's like dragon parts or, you know, kobold noses or something like that. But there's going to be a lot of kobold skulls in my book. It's kind of be one of those things where you're going to read through the book and then at the end it'll say, hey, find six of these and 12 of these. And I really got to start building these things in here um, so that they are hidden in the background. And really that it's just a test for me to kind of make some through lines for this book. 
um, that will make sense. And, and you know, I don't know that it'll ever be production level thing. Like I don't know if it's something that you'd go out and say, oh, I want to buy one of those. But for me, it's really just a a way to continue to work and have a goal that is consistent within the same illustration style and really develop that style and see where it can go. And hopefully through this is you will see is there's some consistent growth right there's some speeding up that happens there's a kind of that leveling up process and then uh, here again following on that whole idea of her being kind of like a roadside meat seller like could you imagine she has one of those giant like kebabs rotating you know and it's like what is what is that made of and she's like shrugs her shoulders like i don't know like in kind of like a you know lunch lady kind of voice but we've got a cleaver. Is the cleaver a little too small? We fix that on the next redraw, and you'll see that. And then um, I'm making a note here that the tartan is going to be a flat pattern, just to myself, just so I know. I, you'll see a lot of those in my work. So now I've completed the redraw on Bristol paper, and I've laid out some inking materials. So what I've got here on the is a couple of selection of brushes. They're not particularly tiny brush either. I've got some Sumi ink in the green bottle there, some clean water and a Tupperware, and then um, a painter's palette. And so what I'll do here is I'll grab the clean water and the Sumi ink and I'll mix it to create some basic color, well not color, some basic value scales that I want to impregnate into the work. What I'm trying to do here is build texture into this, like I said, flat simple shaped world so that even though the shapes are, are simple and the silhouette reads well is that within that the cloak or the apron or her face is going to have this character um, brought on by the inking and it's to emulate fur it's to emulate cloth it's to it's to just make it more lifelike um, but also it's, it's kind of a it's kind of like a I don't want to do this all digitally. At this point, I can certainly take this into this, you know, Photoshop and make this happen. But I feel like you're missing out by by not doing more work digitally here, or not digitally, traditionally. So, um, I and I might, I'm going to just tell you right now, I am by far not a master with the brush and ink. I'm getting better at it, and this is part of this process. It's that like, hey, learning. Um, I was actually surprised by how well I was able to keep this whole thing really even during this process and not really scooted around because as you guys saw that's definitely my process when I'm doing penciling is I have to turn it to so it meets the curve of my hand easier when I'm making a, a certain curve or I'm trying to follow a contour. Um, but this is more like coloring and, and really it I feel like to a degree some of the Im impreciseness of the brush, the large brush, actually kind of helps and aids that, that, hey, the charm here. And what, we've, what we're going to do is we're just going to continue to to lay out that color and really work through adding the values throughout the whole thing. Um, and maybe some shadows. I try not to do too much because you can do a lot in Photoshop, and quite honestly, the results are always going to be better. But, uh, you know, working this texture throughout the whole piece, or most of it, just um, ultimately adds so much character that you, you can't get with just the flat paper. And um, what I'd like to talk about at this point, too, since we're going to be doing a little bit of coloring, is just some of the changes you can see in the character from that initial sketch. So... Let's take a look here. A couple of things is right is we can see those feet a little bit longer, a lot more detailed, right? Um, the the face has retained that basic face shape that we nailed in that first pass, and we refined in the second, and even the third one, right? But um, we've increased the size of the cleaver. We've worked on adding the apron. We've added a button there. We've changed some of the the shape and the look of the teeth there is we have one sharp one but we also have one like bicuspid like a, a flat tooth 
with you know four rounded tops uh, like you might find in in your mouth in the molars or like in the sheep's mouth right so we're playing with that idea of that herbivore carnivore kind of thing right um, and with this and you can see with this process I'm gonna go through a couple times with each of the you know each of the passes and kind of add more value where I think it needs it um, maybe try to get more of a consistent blending that's one thing that I don't see how these watercolor artists, these professionals, really get that that really smooth thing. I think I'm not using enough water, but also the paper I'm using, I understand, is not watercolor paper. It's Bristol, so it's thick enough to take on two or three coats of this, but really starts to, um, you'll see by the end of this, it'll be bending quite a bit in, which is fine because I scan it on a flatbed anyways, and this original just kind of lives in a, a drawer, but, you know, it it's not something that is super ideal for you know the art in general now what i'm doing here is mixing some other colors so i'm mixing a darker darker gray for the areas in shadow so that's the underneath the cloak that's going to be the hooves um the nose parts of the inside of the sleeves um, anything that i think can use a darker value and really also what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create um, this is more of a design principle is just uh, shifts in value from object to object so objects next to each other aren't the same color as the next object next to it right is not only do we have variations in value and they'll have variations in color once they go to digital but they have variations in shape and texture that's all intentional um, and it's just that's something that now I don't have to figure out in Photoshop later. Um, other than doing some basic cleanup, I'm able to just focus on get the colors in there, um, make them work together cohesively, and let the values do a lot of that work, right? It's kind of a principle that if you look at any of Adam Hughes's work, Adam Hughes works in Copic markers um, for his first passes on a lot of his art, but he um, only works in grayscale. And the reason for that is because he then colors it in Photoshop afterwards and is able to get a much more consistent look and, in his mind at least, save some time by not going to digital first, right? He, he's really, you're noodling out. And I, I feel like any time you spend in traditional is, is equity into the piece. You're noodling out what, what problems you have in your illustration and how you're going to solve those problems with value, color, line, texture, right? Um, and we're going to just continue on through there. Um, now, I will tell you, I did make one mistake when doing this piece, when inking it, is that I was a little uh, cavalier with the, the ink in that I want those hooves to be really dark, right? But they have texture on them. And ultimately, it went too dark, so that in the scans, they're almost like black, 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 um, which is not ideal, because there's very few things that I want completely white or completely black in this piece, almost nothing. And, you know, even like the, the fur, the like little top knot that she has there, or the fur that's going to be in her hand is going to be cream or dirty gray or something like that. There's not going to be any true white. Their eyeballs are going to be yellow, right? They're going to be a, a creamy yellow because she's an older sheep, you know? And so there's some, there's some things you got to think about is like, if something's white, it's going to be a highlight. It's going to be, it's going to be the tiniest white thing. So maybe a small sliver on the hatchet, maybe a highlight on her eyeball, but uh, certainly not large swaths of color here. And even though you, I may not apply ink there, my in intention is that it will be a, a color that is not white. All right, uh, we're gonna continue here with doing some inking, and I really wish I could kind of screen through the, the camera uh, into the past myself to stay with this level of this level of darkness here because it looks really really good where I have it here at least to my eye um, and I'm trying to darken it and I think this is where I got the idea is like oh it has to be darker um, because I think 
ultimately the hooves felt too close to the cloak. Uh, but I think, that, you know, that, that seems like such a, a mistake, misstep here, because I know I've since scanned this in and had to correct those digitally and essentially steal color from other parts of the illustration, which isn't particularly ideal. It, it looks fine, and, and ultimately it's not going to be an issue. If I had to, I could certainly just repaint those parts, like it's the hooves, it's the hands. Those would be easy enough to mask out and just redo again. Uh, but but I, th but I think it's, you know, what, is they, what do they say? The enemy of good enough and getting it done is perfection. So I, I want to make sure that this is good enough uh, and it gets done and not it's perfect and I redo it 15 times because I've certainly been in that trap. You know, we all like to think that, oh, I'm thinking about doing this again and I'm thinking about this project and I'm noodling about it. I'm spending some time on it. That thinking is procrastination, right? It's a trap. And it's because we don't want to do something that won't be perfect because we're all perfectionists to a degree. You know, at least every artist I know is. And so really it's like, hey, force yourself to get through it. Force yourself to make it. You can always redo it later, but you have to do it the first time through the whole way. You have to get it done, right? And uh, you can see here I started to get really challenged with where I was going to set my hand. Usually I have the little cloth thing on my hand and I'm able to use that as kind of a rest. And I turn the paper to kind of avoid those wet areas. But because I want to make sure the camera can capture everything, I'm putting my hand precariously down on this paper. I'm kind of balancing it on my pinky. And um, even, you know, probably painting a lot further away from the tip of the paper than I normally would. And that's that's obviously not ideal for me. See, look, this this is a great color right there for that for that hoof, that cleft there. You know, she's got this, you can tell it's darker than the surrounding fur, but and it's darker than than the cape, it looks like, than than their cowl, but you know whatever. <laughs> um, I'm going to be my toughest critic every time. Speaking of, you know, being your toughest critic, uh, I have a, I have, I'm an art director in my outside life and my work. And that's one thing that if you're watching this and you're someone who doesn't do art professionally, or maybe you do and you just need someone like a little bit of advice and, you know, First of all, I'm going to caution you, don't take advice from people on the internet. Now being said that, uh, now having said that, if you do take advice from people on the internet, make sure the advice is, is advice that's geared towards healthy steps for your career, your hobbies, right? Uh, is, that, is that there's no, you're not, none of this stuff, unless you've got an art director or an agent or a publisher that you're trying, or a client that you're trying to impress, none of this stuff has to be perfect. And ultimately, there's there's no reason it should be, because that perfection, like I said, is the enemy to getting it done. But it, it also is an enemy to your your health, right? This you have to like this process. If you don't like this process, you're not going to continue doing it, right? So you're not going to get that sense of accomplishment if I stopped here and was like, oh, I'm not happy with this, and restarted the whole thing. I probably wouldn't work out there today, and I'd probably do something else. I'd play video games or whatever. So it has to be a healthy process for you as well, right? It, you want to make sure you're doing something. You want to make sure you're using your hour, two hours, or however long you said you're going to work on something creative usefully, but also, you know, with a goal in mind, right? To get something done, to to make something happen. And once you do that, you'll feel much better. Um, I always, you know, I get into the weekend and I always be like, I want to do so much stuff. I want to do so much work on my book and so much illustration work. And I, I have this little piece I want to do and I want to work on my 3D stuff. Um, and I think that's the enemy of feeling good about what you've done is you need to set goals that challenge you, but goals that are within the time scale that you have that are realistic, right? And and maybe even a little less than what you think you could push yourself to do because I don't think working 
I like burning on the candle on both ends, but I don't think working so hard has ever been healthy for me. I say that as I'm recording this, it's, it's kind of late at night, but like, I don't, I don't think that, that making art until 6 a.m. in the morning, getting up and working at 8 a.m. in the morning is a useful use of your time. So let's hold ourselves accountable to that, is that, is that when we are making art, if we are growing and we are doing something that we like, that we're also um, holding ourselves accountable to to being healthy with it and and not also not putting ourselves down with the work we're doing. Is finding something that we can be proud of at the end of the day, making it, and then whatever you need to do with it. If you need to put it in a drawer, if you need to show it to a friend, if you need to put it on Instagram, um, whatever gets you to that like sense of I've accomplished something I've done and I can move on to the next step because I think that's the most important thing is is getting it done and doing it and then getting to a point where you can do that consistently healthily and that won't won't drag you down won't drag you to the point where you're like oh well now I don't want to do art because it's such a pain in the butt you know this took me just a couple hours today and the recording and the uploading the video is going to take longer um, but that's okay because I've already done this and this was my goal for this for this weekend was to make sure I, I got started on this and there's a lot more that goes in this illustration like this gal needs like we said like what's her story she needs um she needs a giant <laughs> elephant leg of of mystery meat that rotisserieing behind her right she needs a little kobold like serving wench she needs um you know, some customers maybe. She needs, um, you know, a, a, a boiling thing of stew, of mystery meat. Like, there's a lot of stuff that still goes on here um, to really tell that story. She needs a wagon that's going to have a cross-section in it that's going to be full of all sorts of weird ingredients. And maybe that's part of um, the that's part of the story. Maybe the characters are, are looking for a weird ingredient and she's the only one that has it. Or maybe... You know, they, they, uh, one of the characters is a culinarist, and, and that's something that, that kind of develops that character more, uh, in relation to, and I don't have a name for this character yet, but I'm sure it'll be something, you know, uh, Slavic or something like that. But, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. And, and this is the beauty of getting this done is now, like, I have so much thought in my head about what, what this character does and what else can go with her. Um, that if I just think about without having the character done, it's just idle thought. But now I have something on paper so I can grow on this, you know? So I can make that, all that stuff. And I've got a, an angle to work with that's not bad. You know, it's a it's a pretty flat angle, but for, for what it, my idea is, this is a, a kind of a child's picture book. This is not, you know, a, this is a simplified look at, um, look at a character that shows the character and the design process that I went through and builds the world, right? Um, you know, it's funny, I'm supposed to be talking to you about technique that I'm kind of doing here, but I'm really talking to you more about my philosophy with with working. Um, but you can, I think you can see here, um, what I'm trying to do with these horns is not paint them in like I did the robes, not do these straight lines. I'm doing kind of a almost like blotting technique and the idea behind that is is that I'm creating a different texture because those horns are very close to the same color as the 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 vestments so like really focusing on okay how can I make these look different and also they're going to taper the value tapers off at the end of the horn I don't want it to go all the way so those are conscious choices that I'm making to kind of develop a a texture language within this character that keeps things different and I could even see where if someone if you were so inclined you could even take this and and do you know fur and uh, little tufts of fur drawn into the the rest of the character well you know you can see here guys look what I did there's that too dark black and here's a huge mistake I could have gone in and and really made this black work, but I let it sit for just a few seconds. And that's all that needs on 
a dry paper to basically impregnate itself into that paper and it's going to become this dark spot that looks fine in some things like that left hoof that I'm working on right now looks just fine but I'm taking so long with it that the right hoof the nose and that hand are drying out and so this ink is additive I'm never going to be able to get that dark on that spot I'm going to if I go over it I'm going to go ahead and make it even darker and that's kind of a mistake here so that's something to learn from is that ultimately I should have stopped where it was. I think this has been a perfect place to kind of say, okay, yeah, this is good, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, or maybe done some of the work on some other pieces, but I shouldn't have, I don't think I should have changed the values to this extreme, just because I know that this dark of black won't scan well. It, it just won't. And, and, you know, it's fine. It, again, it was all cleaned up, but um, there's much more delicate you know, processes like, why not just go into Photoshop and darken that 10% or add a dark purple there or, you know, some kind of dark navy blue to, to get the color you're looking for. But instead, you can see I'm spending a lot of time trying to blend that in and it's just not going to blend. And, you know, well, now as I'm looking at this in playback, like, that's, it's not horrible, but, you know, it certainly draws your eye, but... Ultimately, I have lost all the detail in in there. So the texture that I was going for, that I wanted, is gone um, because it's completely dark black. And that's something you have to watch out for with Sumi Ink is if you go straight to the bottle and don't mix it thoroughly, this is what happens. So that um, that unfortunately does you know work against this. Um, in, in the pictures that I think that I took, I, I really do like it. Um, but the scan, again, like I said, doesn't come out with a lot of quality. And now I've kind of made a decision, hey, I'm gonna go with this value scale. Um, I've gotta do this to the rest. But now that I've, I'm gonna do it in one pass, you can see that, that right hand, the one holding the hatchet, is so much more even. And you can see the detail still, but it's nowhere near as dark as it needs to be to match the nose. Or the other hooves because the ink has had time to kind of settle in in the the color pot and become more consistent well um, but there's really no time to cry over spilt milk or ink for that matter so I'm gonna continue on here and um, I'm gonna go ahead and take a lighter hand with the rest of this you can see I, I've doing the eyeballs and the irises I'm just going in that one pass and doing a darker color but um, lighter than the nose. I'm going to do the same thing with the button. So what I'm trying to do here is create areas of dark to contrast light and provide interest and also somewhere for your eye to move as it carries across the creature, right? So, you know, we've got the eyes, we've got the nose, we've got these hooves, but you know, like let's throw some of this darkness onto the clothing, into details there that will make sense for the character. So like a big rustic button holding up one side of the apron makes sense to me, you know, and then let's deepen these shadows here because we are changing the value scale ultimately on the character design. And, and really that means you need to bring the other values to match because wouldn't it be weird if the shadows are not the darkest thing on the on a character. I think it would. So making another pass there. Definitely. So we're kind of nearing the end of this and I'm making some final decisions as far as colors and and what I do and don't want to color. I think there's a couple things that looking at this here, you know, you could go certainly one of two ways, right? The apron is going to be some kind of leather. So you could certainly add some texture there. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to, but um, I think because I was gun shy about the failures I made in previous steps, I wanted to can, kind of simply move through this and and find the easy, you know, like, okay, the shadow's definitely got to be colored in, so I'm going to do the shadow on the bell, right? And then, well, I want this color, this cleaver to be two-tone, so let's go ahead and do that as well. And I'll, I'll get through that in just a second. 
And then also the collar here uh, that holds the bell, I want it to be darker as well because it provides a way to frame the sheep's face without you know having to darken or lighten her face right we're providing a, a your eye like oh there's a border there right you can more clearly delineate where her head is um, because we're adding details that make your eye go oh i see that's a tuft of hair in the ear or there's a shadow there right and then also like okay the cleaver's got two different kind of types of metal, right? Those textures of metal. And I'm being very uneven with the with the metal here on the cleaver and intentionally because it's it's warped, it's going to be rusty maybe, it's going to be um, aged, right? Uh, and the blade is is not particularly sharp. You know, maybe it's dull, maybe it'll have some some icker on it, right? Um, and then, you know, again, like I go through here and I'm going to make a mistake on this rounded inner part right I could have simply kept the same color and, and color that in post but I did kind of a sloppy job here of coloring this in again it's not um you know use the towel to clean a little bit of it off I actually um, go back and use some ink pens to clean that up uh, but you, you kind of have to know when enough is enough right and it doesn't make sense to make every tiny little detail with your brush if you're going to do that detail badly and you're going to mess it up. So we're here at the end. I want to say thanks so much for watching. It's a long video, I know. If you liked it, please give it a like. If you disliked it, dislike it. Any comments are certainly appreciated, especially on what to work on next. Uh, please subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. And thanks so much. Here's an example of the piece that I threw on Instagram. Thank you and uh, see you again soon. Bye.